Welcome back to our podcast. Today we have returning guest Bruno Cluliar, who is the president and one of the co-founders and the CEO of Crypto Foray, an IT security company. And Bruno, welcome back to the uh, podcast. Thank you for uh, inviting me again, uh, James. Bruno, there's there's a lot going on in terms of the where computing power and uh, computing resources are actually located. Back in the day, it used to be in the mainframes, and then there was a lot in the desktops, as you're well aware. Servers, cloud computing, it's that's where it all is today. There's a lot of uh, discussion going on in terms of where the computing is actually going to reside, whether it's going to reside on the edge, for example, on the Internet of Things. Really cool stuff going on in the gaming world as to whether the device itself, the cell phone, will have the computing for the high high uh, processing games or whether that will actually be on the server and the device itself will just be almost like what we used to refer to in the old days as a, as a dumb terminal. It'll just have the capability to interact with a distant server. So lots of cool things going on there. So that really implies in my mind that we're moving from the uh, version or the vision of servers that we have today. And as I think you're, you're well aware, we need to move into server 2.0 and what that capability will be as we we have the Internet of Things, we have all kinds of gaming on handheld devices. So I imagine, Bruno, that this has real implications in terms of the way the server architecture is going to be set up. So what are some of the implications? And perhaps you could describe for us what the cloud world is going to be like, cloud 2.0. Yes, um, very, uh, very astute observations. Um, indeed, the proliferation of communication capabilities that have that we have enjoyed in the last couple of decade, decades uh, have provided us the ability or the new um, flexibility to reallocate and redeploy how we intend to use our computing power. It used to be that um, the computing power had to be co-resident with uh, those of us that used computer in the early days. Now you're starting to see a redeployment of the compute capability into those cloud uh, farm, server farms um, that you can activate or deactivate the computing capability that you require and um, there's the proliferation of these new handheld device the mobile uh, device which now act as our terminals and many of us are enjoying quite a large amount of capability due to those pretty advanced uh, mobile device uh, so in essence we're moving into uh, a new era of computing where computing has, re has been redistributed to better be, um, be most efficient for the vast majority of us where chances are you're not demanding compute power at the same level all the time. Uh, you will have peak demand and then you'll go back to a lull and a cloud environment provides that perfect um, ability to uh, give you the power that you need when you need it and uh, not need it or not give it to you when you don't. So from that perspective, um, this new era is uh, perfectly matching what our demand looks like. Uh, and as we're moving forward, most of our compute capability is becoming redistributed and a lot of the sensitive, uh, critical foundational capability is basically moving in the cloud. Now, Bruno, I also see um, that there's a potential for a hybrid approach. If we look at uh, VMware and what Amazon and some of the other cloud computers are, are doing, VMware provides that virtualization within the organization. And then we have cloud computing such as Amazon, Google, IBM, and the rest of them. And, and it looks like we're moving towards a hybrid world of both virtual in the organization, as well as some of the processing being done in the cloud. Now, what are the implications for things such as randomization or 
this very essence of time itself if we have this distributed architecture? Excellent questions again. <laughs> the One of the critical things that, uh, so what, with that uh, flexibility that we've now found ourselves um, with, the ability to onboard more and more of our um, world's economy uh, on, a, on a very complex stack of software running into either these uh, cloud-designed or cloud-based environments or our own um, on-premise cloud variants, what we're finding is we're finding that more of our economy is now running on very critical applications and both time and um, entropy are critical resources that these machines now require. If you think of it in terms of what it takes to run a cloud or a server farm, typically you would need good power, uh, good access to cooling and heating, as well as a good communication network. More and more, uh, what we're finding is that in addition to these three foundational elements, you also need uh, very precise access to time as well as entropy uh, sources. And in, with respect to time, uh, a lot of machines that are running around the world need very fine precision synchronization. Today we used our we use the GPS uh, navigation systems that has been allowed or that has been open to the public in the 2000 time frame by the US um, for uh, for the computers around the world to be synchronized very precisely to within nanoseconds. The challenge that's coming up, uh, in recent years is that these GPS signals may actually be spoof. They're actually fairly easy to uh, modify and spoof and to shift your local clock if that's all you have access to, uh, to make it um, view different timings on it. In combination or at the same time as this is happening, uh, more and more research seemed to indicate the need for creating a strong source of entropy in cloud environments where whether you're running in Google or Azure or Amazon or your own virtual environment uh, using a VMware capability, those machines that you're spinning up, uh, that those virtual machines and those virtual environments do not necessarily are do not necessarily get access to a source of entropy uh, that's locally um, sufficient for generating solid and strong key material. So now you have this, this these two very critical elements to the data data centers of the future that now need to be uh, delivered in a secure and reliable fashion. And that's the next challenge, I think, in, in terms of making sure that the infrastructure is keeping up with the demand we're asking it to deal with. Bro, maybe you can give us a, a deeper dive in this idea of a time architecture because we're familiar with atomic clocks and a centralized time source. If we have this distributed architecture, and, and I believe what you're implying is that time is computed in a distributed way and then synchronized, how is that going to work if time is decentralized? Don't we start to go back to the day in which, you know, before uh, standard time zones, for example, where every region kept its own time and therefore was wildly inaccurate? How would, how would a, a distributed time architecture work? How would they make sure that they are synchronized? In today's age, you have access to um, very advanced uh, atomic clock that can be built inside um, deployable asset in a, in a data center, for example. The challenge that you typically have is to ensure that these uh, capabilities, these source of time, are properly secure against attacks and spoofing of the time element. What you want to do is you don't want to simply 
have a time source, you want a secure time source, uh, a source that you have very strong um, uh, authenticity and the fact that you know it is still, uh, it will not be modified by a spoofing attack, for example. These time source are for, you know, for all intents and purposes, are equivalent to um, a standard um, uh, sampling that uh, you would need to have uh, calibrated on a yearly basis as an example where you do the calibration process and once you get the certificate to operate uh, these machines would operate for a year a year or two uh, based on this internal clock and so you want to be able to have that sort of very strong time element that you can trust will deliver to the rest of your system a precise and reliable uh, time that will not be spoofed. Bruno, can you give us some examples of what could go wrong here outside of GPS, which we're all familiar with? And suppose that the servers sometime is spoofed and it's off by milliseconds. One server is slightly inaccurate from the other server. What's the consequence of that? I mean, what could go wrong with that? How could that be used by a hacker? Many of the financial systems out there are based on extremely precise transaction models that depend on a time precision in, in the nanosecond. Uh, you have machines that are distributed around the globe that perform uh, in, in a very, and in that case, it's a very real time uh, scenario. We're talking nanoseconds of precision within, within these, these machines. They have to be synchronized and there can't be any modifications of some of these transactions. Otherwise you end up with a very uh, complex set of transactions that may have been rejected because the, the source of time on some of these servers may have been spoofed in a prop, improper direction. So uh, a lot of the economy that uh, our world depends on today and a lot of those systems are now uh, very dependent on extremely precise and, and reliable clocking systems. And the, the problem or the the challenge with the GPS system, if you're using it, uh, you get good precision. However, you may be getting a spoof signal uh, that will make you believe you're getting, your clock is drifting off by a few microseconds off one way or another. And you will actually get to see that this is, um, this will cause issues in, in some of our most advanced infrastructural systems today. That's, uh, that's, that's really cool. And of course, if we look in the, the larger context, uh, time, uh, distance and gravity are all related. So hopefully we're not getting down to the, to the level of accuracy that the distance around the globe makes a big difference. But let's, let's move on to entropy and why entropy is a, a critical issue in, in architectures such as this. Maybe you could just start us off with a quick primer as to why entropy is such an issue in um, kryptonization. The very funny thing about security is that for the best of security, uh, if you're using cryptographic algorithms, you require the best entropy source possible to make sure your key generation is ultimately um, random, properly random. Um, the Kirchhoff principle of uh, security is that the only secret you should be worried about is that of the key. Uh, your design, your algorithms should all be uh, known and should all be based on openly available standards, but you wanna make certain that the keys that you use are very random and if you have a 256 bit key, you better hope that all 256 bits of that key are random bits and that they're not predictable and that you cannot guess what they are. The challenge that we've seen in uh, recent years is that um, as we 
typically advance, uh, and that's the story of humanity. This is not just about security. It pretty much uh, is a replica of what we have done over the uh, over the ages. When we uh, initially started building the foundation of the internet in the early mid '90s, basically when um, SSL was invented uh, at the same time as public key infrastructure or PKI were being developed and the use of keys, public private key pair, uh, we had to come up with techniques that would allow computers, general purpose machines, to generate some random data. And uh, computers have been designed from very much their early days to be digital machines that always perform the same task the same way every single time. What we ended up doing is we enlisted human beings in the early days as the source of entropy. So we had users uh, that would be asked to take their mouse and wiggle the mouse around and draw bizarre shapes on their computer screen in order to have or to create entropy. And that was perfectly fine and it worked really well in the early days. We learned to use more, in, more proper techniques over time. We started using human beings' activity around a computer, such as what is the video card memory filled up with, uh, what is the access to the disk drive like, uh, network access, and so on. So we built up quite a good repertoire of access to entropic data that was ultimately generated by human beings and human activities with computers. What happened is we kind of went on to other tasks and we kind of built up more and more layers on top of that security foundation that we felt was solid until we realized that if you take these foundational capabilities and you put them into virtual machines, for example, where the same virtual machine that gets recreated on thousands of different servers, you are now no longer capable of using human activities. These virtual machines are, for all intents and purposes, clones. And chances are, more than one machine will end up generating the same key material. Same thing happens if you take the same software and put it into an embedded device, a small internet of thing, like an IoT device. What you'll find is that there are no human beings that are involved in the generation of random data and when you do not have any activity other than the machine digital activity is really hard so what we're finding now is we're finding that we've built up a lot of layers on top of the stack and the current layers that we've added to the foundation which one of one of which was random data uh, is really frail it's actually it needs to be fixed so one of the things that we're, um, we're kind of seeing is that in the future data center of tomorrow, in the data centers of tomorrow, when we you know, agglomerate uh, all of these compute capabilities into large and vast arrays of compute machine, uh, we need to have access to solid time as well as solid entropy in order to feed those machines with entropy that's being generated with hardware and that this has got to be part of the foundation of the new, if you wish, um, data center 2.0 <laughs> in terms of security foundations. Okay, cool. Thank you, Bruno. As we get towards the end of our podcast for today, do you have a, a takeaway for both the academic audience as well as the practitioner audience? One of the um, uh, takeaway here, I guess, is that on the um, when you feel that you have achieved quite a lot of uh, success on building found on top of some foundations of any kind, sometimes it's good to go back and validate that those foundations are still or your assumptions uh, that you use are still legitimate or are still valid. In the case of entropy, uh, we had assumed entropy had been affixed or had been resolved or so, you know, the solution was, was there, uh, it turns out that it's not. In terms of time, uh, we had assumed that GPS time was 
the solution for all our problems. It turns out that it is actually not the same. Uh, it is not the case. Uh, we have to be very cognizant of the importance of these things. So when you're you advance in time and we when we build so much of our um, foundation of our economy and our day to day lives on this very impressive machines that we've called the Internet, um, we have to also keep it up to date and make sure we do not, um, you know, we have to keep our eyes focused on some of those foundational elements. And if they need to be fixed, we need to go back and retrofit what we have in play. So always good to um, to check your, your assumption once in a while. And sometimes you have to uh, make some adjustments. And that's, I think, uh, what we need to do here for our, for these activities for time and uh, entropy. Bruno, it sounds as if some of that adjustment may be more radical than incremental. I don't think it is. I think for the most, the vast majority of these, these capabilities exist and the protocols exist. Uh, what we need to do is we need to improve on the usage of machines that can produce uh, trusted or assured time services uh, as well as entropy and uh, that is currently evolving uh, you know this is not uh, reinventing the internet it's simply adjusting and making sure that the internet keeps progressing as it advances into becoming such a foundational capability to our society uh, i think we need to continue improving it and and uh, shoring up our, our security um, capability by making use of, of these these tools that we have our, at our disposal. So I don't think it's um, uh, radical. I think it's just a very incremental and, and needs to be improved you know, carefully and, and swiftly, I guess. Okay, thank you very much, Bruno. The, thank you for joining us today again. My pleasure and uh, looking forward to the next time, perhaps. Absolutely. <laughs> Take care. Okay, goodbye.